Our little bit of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians are just a, uh, a little flavor, a little touch of what that letter is largely about, which is the church, the church as the body of Christ, the church as the bride of Christ. And in those few lines that we have from Paul, he's exhorting the Christians in Ephesus to stop squabbling, to be gentle and bear with each other, to be patient, and to live in peace and harmony. And then a word that keeps popping up just in those three or four sentences is one, one body, one bride, one marriage. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about the unity of the church. How do we know we're in the right church? How do we know when we're in Jesus' church? Or anybody that's interested on the outside, either other Christians or other kinds of believers or pagans, if they want to know what the Catholic Church is, how do they recognize it? Well, if you're going to get serious, it's not by the cross on top of the, uh, the building, and it's not by the outfit the guys wear. Uh, those things give you a hint. But if you really want to know how you tell Jesus church, the one that he founded, and he only founded one. There it is again, one. Um, there are four marks, and the first one is, guess what? One. Jesus' church is one. It's also holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Um, just a little bit about those, this, the second, third, and fourth marks. Holy because, the church is holy because it makes saints. Saints is from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. Saint means holy one. And that's us, hopefully. It's not magic. And we have to cooperate with God's gift of holiness, sanctifying grace. Um, also, the church is custodian and giver, distributor of the means to God's life. It's been that it, the only means that we know that has been revealed to us, called the ordinary means, which are the seven sacraments. That's how you get holy, by building, being built up by God's life in those seven sacraments. Catholic. Catholic is usually translated, if it's translated at all, a, a, a fair synonym of it is universal, but that really doesn't capture it. The Greek is kata ho, uh, holikos, two words, but made into one, kataholigos, Catholic, um, which means something like, kind of awkward, according to the sum, according to the whole, according to the totality. What whole, what sum, what totality? The, the sum, the whole, and the totality of God's gifts to man. Everything that we need to believe, everything that we need to do, everything that we need to accept, um, and it's for everybody. The call to the Catholic Church, to Jesus' Church, is to everybody, no exceptions. Right now, he's calling Muslims, he's calling Zen Buddhists, he's calling pagans, he's calling Satanists, he, and he's calling us. Because too many of us have a superficial or a patchy, uh, full of gaps kind of idea of what it means to be members of Jesus' church, members of God's family in this world. Um, and then apostolic. And apostolic means founded by Jesus on the apostles, Peter and the 11. And our bishops today are the successors of those apostles. Those four marks can tell anybody who's interested, this is the Catholic church. This is the church that Jesus Christ founded. Now, I just want a little bit more about the mark one, unity. <clears throat> In a certain way, one, sort of like the, this is, it's an analogous to uh, religious take vows, poverty, chastity, obedience, most of us, but one group, at least the only one group that I know of, the Dominicans just take one vow, obedience. Gee, aren't they supposed to be chaste? Aren't they supposed to be celibate and poor too? Yeah, but obedience covers everything. And one covers holy, 
<coughs> uh, 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 um, Catholic, holy, and apostolic, at least in general terms. Now, in this unity, there's a lot of diversity. <clears throat> Jesus, uh, St. Paul writes to the Ephesians. He also wrote to the Corinthians. The Ephesians were <clears throat> over in what's now Turkey. Uh, the Corinthians were down in southern Greece. He writes to people in Asia, he writes to people all over. He tells them similar things, but also tailored to their needs, whatever the crisis is, because Jesus did that. What was Jesus' last commandment? His last instruction before he went back to his father. He said, go out into the whole world and preach this gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's our job, all Christians, but especially the bishops and priests in, in hierarchical and, and ordained ways. Um, um, and that... Uh, when we accept Jesus Christ, we accept his church. And <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion about this, <clears throat> especially since unity is not something that's noticeable among Christians. Some of you may know this. I just checked it up because my, my figure was kind of old. I just checked it yesterday. There are in the world today over 34,000 denominations. That doesn't mean churches. <laughs> that doesn't mean little uh, 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 buildings, that, you know, some storefront that a born again set up. That means denominations with a title. And some of them have hundreds of churches. This is one of the reasons uh, Mahatma Gandhi once said when somebody gave him the Bible and said he was trying, it was, a, it was a Christian who was trying to evangelize him. And he said, would you read this? He gave him some passages and later, Gandhi brought him back the Bible, and he said, if Christians were what this book describes, there wouldn't be a Hindu left in India. Um, just as the prophets told the chosen, the people of God, before Jesus came, that the world is scandalized and blasphemes the name of Yahweh Shabaoth because of you, because of your behavior. Uh, why are there 34,000 denominations? Why aren't we one? Well, it's not the Holy Spirit's fault. And the principle of all unity, integrity in Jesus' church is the one true God. And that means each of the persons. Uh, the Father, the source of everything good. Jesus, through whom God created everything and for whom he created everything. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is the soul of Jesus' church. Not their fault that we're this messed up and this fractured. So who belongs in the church of Jesus Christ? Well, first, the, those who are baptized. We have three sacraments that initiate you into Jesus' church. Baptism, confirmation, and the Holy Eucharist. So everybody baptized is in Jesus Church. But that's just the beginning. That's the beginning of the beginning, the, the initiation of the initiative, sacraments of initiation. Then you want to, we're supposed to, not everybody does it. Some people graduate from the church before they're confirmed. A lot of people graduate at confirmation. Some do it at First Communion. But you need all three to be a full, total, member of the Church of Jesus Christ. Since everybody here has received those sacraments, does that mean everybody here is a saint? Probably not. Doubt it. And if all the baptized are Christians, why isn't there noticeable unity? Why are we a scandal to the world, to the pagans, to the non-believers, and to the other religions? Why, after 2,000 years, 2,000 years after Jesus gave that command, go out into the world and preach this gospel 
to all creatures, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why are we only a billion strong in this planet, which has got, I don't know what, seven billion or something now? Um, it's our fault. So a little bit about the ways that we can begin to recover the unity that Jesus gave to us and means us to have again. This is ecumenism, which is the recovery of Christian unity. Um, too often, it's kind of a token thing. Why? Well, again, it's our fault. Uh, whatever kind of Christian we are. Um, we have ideas, notions, prejudices against other kinds of Christians. Uh, Baptists about uh, Anglicans, and uh, Presbyterians about Catholics, and you name it, all these thousands of, we all have opinions, and some of them, some of them are true or partly true, but they keep us separated. And then we have resentments, and we have baggage from going all the way back 2,000 years, because this didn't start with Luther, and it didn't start with the split in the 11th century, East and West, it started in Jesus' own time, and these letters that Paul writes are addressing these things which are destroying the church, these splits in Galatia and in Ephesus and in Corinth, and everywhere. It's everywhere in Rome. Um, now, what is true ecumenism? I took most of my material from two sources. One, the decree on ecumenism from the Council Fathers, the Second Vatican Council, and uh, an encyclical letter, Ut Unum Sint, that they may be one. It's a quote from Jesus in St. John's Gospel. Father, that I'm praying for my disciples, my sheep, that they may be one. Um, on ecumenism, real ecumenism, what does it mean? As I say there's sometimes a tendency for us, probably never consciously, to think of it in terms of a token. Let's get together in dialogue. And what does that mean? Uh, there's dialogue that's just chatter. Uh, and there's dialogue that's got a mean spirit to it, throwing up the old uh, grievances. And uh, one of the things John Paul II says is, part of dialogue has to be an examination of conscience, admitting where we were wrong. You mean Jesus' true church, the one true church it was wrong? Well, not the church, because the church is both. It's human and divine. It's indefectible, it's perfect, and it's infallible because the Holy Spirit is in charge. But we're also in there messing it up with our stupidity and our sins and our ignorance. Um, that's what we have to examine our consciences about. What steps can we take to recover this integrity that Jesus means, and not only means to, that his church have, it does have. Uh, there is only one church. Oh, well, well, you mean the Catholic Church, is that it? If you're, if you're some other kind of Christian, you're not really a Christian? Yes, you are a Christian, but you're not fully. You're not perfectly. We have the fullness of truth. We have the fullness of grace. Everything from Jesus meant for all men to have, and he wants everybody in his church, and he wants everybody saved through his church. We haven't achieved that. We're still on the way. Um, and the Catechism and both those documents, those ecumenical documents, talk about the distinctions. Catholic Christian who knows and lives his faith, that's as much in the church as you can be. Um, how about all the other Christians, all the other denominations that have a lot and even most of Revelation and Jesus' truth and some sacraments, baptism, most of them, uh, marriage, matrimony, um, but imperfect partial, incomplete. Jesus wants, one of the things we have to resist and fight is a clubby, chauvinistic, sectarian, us against them attitude. Um, we are to love everybody. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Do we love the Baptists? Do we love the, uh, every other, think of people you know that are some kind of uh, non-Catholic Christian that get on your nerves. Are you doing anything about it? Are you loving them a little more? Because we're going to find out, and this is really the point I'm building to, 
Ecumenism is a big, and it sounds to me, it always sounds like kind of vague in general. Ecumenism, what the heck is that? It's bringing Jesus' family, bringing Jesus' uh, church back together into the, the unity, the integrity that he means it to have. And it does have that. How much you are a Catholic depends on your cooperation with grace and your knowledge of the truth. And this, and I have to convict myself of this, I never think in ecumenical terms. I'm very comfortable with a bunch of Catholics, especially if they're old Catholics like me, and they know the same stuff that I do, and they used to worship the way I do. Ah, I can just settle into that. I don't want to go out and talk to Baptists. A lot of the time, I don't even want to talk to Catholics. I've been talk to Presbyterians, talk to uh, Unitarians. Um, but that's what he wants us to do. Here are the, uh, a few of the things that are recommended in those ecumenical documents and in the catechism that we can do to help the recovery of unity. First of all, praying, the most important, the most fundamental, and the one that we can do, no matter if we're in an iron lung, we can make that contribution. Um, praying especially with our separated brothers, which I hear is no longer uh, politically correct term with whatever the heck we call non-Catholic Christians nowadays. Um, work and service. I'm a cradle Catholic, and I was raised in an all-Catholic environment, uh, a, a, a barrio, a, a Mexican, a Chicano neighborhood in, in East Los Angeles. I never knew any Protestants until I was an adult. Never even met one. I mean, I might have met one somewhere, but I don't remember. I never had any acquaintances, much less friends that were Protestant. But when I was doing pro-life work, I met and worked with and prayed with all kinds of non-Catholic Christians for the first time, came to know them, learned to respect them, to see what good Christians these people, this is doing pro-life work mostly, uh, came to love them. And they got to see Catholics, whom a lot of them thought had horns and tails. Uh, well, some of them. But a lot of them thought we were a sect or a cult, or we certainly weren't Christian. Some Catholics might be Christian. They were sometimes willing to grant that. When we work and pray and do Christ some kind of service, some kind of ministry in the church together, and it's not always easy. Matter of fact, it's usually not easy. Um, we start to gain knowledge and respect, which you must have for a dialogue to be worth anything. <clears throat> this is also a caveat. Uh, Dialogue must never compromise the truth. Because when you compromise the truth for the sake of, can't we all just get, al get along? You know? uh, no, that's called false hermeticism. If there isn't harmony, we say there isn't harmony. And we'd be gentle, like Paul says, we'd be gentle, patient, charitable, loving, open, tolerant, uh, but within boundaries. We don't blur the church so that we can all get along. That's not, a, that's not a help. And that's not ecumenism. That's false ecumenism, false hermeticism, you know, peace at any price, not at the price of the truth. And of course, that doesn't make us together. That's not harmony. That's the first and creepy step toward more chaos. Um, permanent renewal of the church. The church is a living thing. Some of us get stuck in a certain place in the church. The church always does this. The church has to be this. Now, the church is a living thing, and it grows like any plant, like any animal. Uh, I love the way it's described by St. Vincent of Laran. He says, um, there's, he makes a distinction. There's alteration and there's change. A living thing changes. A baby doesn't look like a toddler. A toddler doesn't look like a big kid. A kid doesn't look like an adult. Essentially, they're exactly the same thing. Their DNA, identical. Uh, and then there's alteration, where a change comes about, where the thing starts to become something else, not good. So we have to be always being renewed, which means what? Adapting, looking for new ways to do our mission. The mission of the church was bring Jesus to everybody, starting with us within Jesus' church, to our separated brothers, to those who are Christian, but don't have the fullness of the truth, and don't have the fullness of the grace and all the sacraments. We have to make it attractive. We have to do it in a way that people want to listen to. 
These are human skills to some extent, mostly grace. But are we doing any of that? Are we praying that somebody will do it? Some priest, some committee, somebody. Um, and then the last and the most important, uh, because it's the one we can all do, uh, it's, again, starts with prayer and ends with prayer, conversion of heart and holiness of life. What, when does the church grow? When there are visible saints, when Catholics have heroic virtue, when they die for their faith. And I don't mean just necessarily getting their heads chopped off or burned at the stake or anything like that, but they die daily. They die to the, to the bad inclinations in themselves, their bad habits, and they are edifying. They build you up. Build who up? Anybody looking at them that isn't sold out to evil and is irked by any holiness and goodness he sees. So when you and I get rid of our bad habits and we grow in virtue and we open ourselves up, ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, you lead us, we become advertisements for the fullness of Jesus' revelation and his one true church. At the end of uh, Unum Sint, John Paul says, I'm going to close with Paul's words from Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and make them my own. Mend your ways. He's talking about getting the church all together again and then reaching out and getting everybody into Jesus' church. Mend your ways. That's the first thing he said in his public life. Repent and believe the gospel. It's fundamental, and we don't go forward and we don't recover unity without you and I mending our ways. Stop being bad. Stop being lazy and selfish. Be generous. Imitate Jesus. Mend your ways, John Paul says, Paul says. Encourage one another. Live in harmony. And the God of love and peace will be with you.